<laughs> that was a nice ring. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks to Cooley and thanks to all my fellow Brevity Eastas. Is that a word? Uh, Brevity Eastas. Brevity Eastas. Yeah, uh, I'll work on that. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out. You could have gone to see the new Twilight movie, but you came here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So, yeah, is this going to work? Probably not. Um, so, yeah, I think in the spirit of brevity, I thought I would just, like, read every piece I wrote in Cooley's class. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's true. <laughs> but it's going to be a mashup, so I'm only going to read, like, a paragraph from each, so um, it'll be really short. <laughs> She was raised on a surfeit of maudlin greeting cards, kitschy scratch-and-sniff valentines, and wretch-inducing ah lines, sprinkled liberally in the tender moments of audience-tested sitcoms and after-school specials, until even she admits she found herself gagging instead of getting choked up at the music musical cues, the plaintive minor key changes, the sotto voce piano trilling that became so maddeningly possessive they triggled, triggered in her a simulacrum of what then passed as feeling. She reached for the box of tissues. She couldn't help herself. But these scenes from the writer's childhood left her feeling manipulated, dirty even, and used, and therefore slightly more defensive even now. For the author's emotional investment in the soap operas of her youth was rarely ever commensurate with the feelings they were able to elicit. Her tears flowed freely like the juice of some unexpected pomegranate, and afterward she moped around the house, ate a tuna fish sandwich, and felt like a grade-A sucker. You probably already curate a private museum in the overstuffed attic of your mind. My friend says everyone has ten Picassos that truly speak to him there. I say, if this one's indelibly tattooed on your heart, it hardly constitutes an act of theft at all. No, you're not stealing the Picasso. The Picasso is stealing you. Missing finger. Do you know when it first got away? That may be helpful. <laughs> Ask around your neighbors, your friends. See if they've noticed anyone with 11 in your area. <laughs> no, man, that's where you're wrong, buddy boy. I don't, I don't have to take that crap, okay? I'm a grown-up, man. I'm an adult, okay? Every man for himself, right? Right? Women too, okay? Everything. Animals, every goddamn single thing. Even the cockroaches, man. The goddamn CRs know better than that. It's called rugged individualism, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> now I know you've got a lot in your plates, but we really gotta swing for the fences on this one. No more excuses. Hang tough or go home. It's fourth and ten and we're loaded for bear. I'm telling you, these dogs will hunt. So lead, follow, or get out of the way. I ain't got time for babysitting. I'm not here to lick your wounds or lick your dicks or kiss your boo-boos and tell you everything will be all right. No, they don't pay me enough for that. You want your head shrunk? You want to get soft? You want to get in touch with your feelings? I'll show you the goddamn door. <laughs> it seemed like everyone who worked there was younger than him. He appreciated their enthusiasm didn't want to be seen as an old prick in the mud, didn't want to be a Cassandra either, so constantly reminded himself to smile, even though he was sure he looked like an idiot, grinning and nodding some holy fool, walking around the company's labertine hallways. The place was huge. After a long day at his desk, he'd wander the corridors in the afternoon, trying to remember how to get back to the cafeteria. How long had he been out here, anyway? Surely the hall's design was someone's idea of a practical joke, something right out of one of those video games these kids played when they were younger, a fractal of reflexive nostalgia meant to remind them of their not-so-distant past. It was spooky, just a little bit. No light, 
save for a few blue exit signs, glowing coolly and leading nowhere. He was lost. Hated to admit it, but he was. Exactly how, he'd been, how long he'd been in the labyrinth now, he wasn't sure. He'd never had a very good sense of direction. Birthday, I asked. I said, I don't want anything else. I said, buy me this and you don't have to buy me anything ever again. He said, we'll see. She said, what's it rated? I said, all the kids are playing it. She said, what's it rated? I said, I don't know. She said, how much does it cost? I said, it's a work of art. <laughs> she said, how much? I said, you can't put a price on a work of art. She said, well then, you better start saving, mister. I said, I'll mow the lawn. She said, you already do that. I said, what else can I do? She said, you ever read Adam Smith? I said, no, really. Maybe you ought to set up a lemonade stand. I did, but it was hot, so I drank all the lemonade. <laughs> Dad came home, said, son, you make me proud. Said, son, you're an entrepreneur like me. I had no idea what he was going on about. Success is its own reward, he said. I said, I only want to play the game. He said, that's the spirit. He said, the grass is always greener. I said, Mom already rode my ass about the lawn. <laughs> you know, rocks have only one way of expressing themselves when they're angry. My friend Acosta, I don't think he'd object to me calling him a friend. Well, he'd get so worked up, all those layers under pressure coming to bear, he'd just start rolling. It's all kinetic with rocks. They just need to work it all out of their systems, leave little bits of themselves behind as they find their own definition of entropy. After four billion years, you'd think my friend would have it all worked out, but he's done so much rough and tumble living. He could taste bitter root on the tip of his tongue, the fortnight that followed, always there just before he gave into exhaustion, eyes twitching, revealing such fecund dreams, brain seething whenever the distant light of some unimaginable kingdom drew close, delivering prophecies like dry goods on a chartered steamship whose ferrymen were angels. He awoke one morning, a drowning man, limbs still locked in paralysis, spasmodically gasping for air, imagining something as distant as Kolob, underground, full of primordial fish, something which even he, with his dowsing rod, could not see clearly. I think this is the last one. She peers out the window through parted curtains. She thinks you two are marathon dancers, legs starting to sag and buckle, shooting horses, bloodshot eyes barely opened, falling into a half embrace on her manicured Kentucky bluegrass. This blue-haired matron, a stalwart tax-paying citizen, the upright holder of community values, a member of the Kiwanis Club and the Chamber of Commerce, president pro tem of the All Women's Ancillary Garden Club, appears most concerned at present for the health of her gardenias. She thinks about turning on the sprinklers. She wants to give you a good soaking, like breaking up two dogs in heat, but before she can do it, the physical act of reaching out for the hose suddenly reminds her of her own true love, Barry. Dead or forgotten, so many years ago, so far away, never calls or writes, her anger rises, her determination doubles. She steps up on her porch, arches her heels, and stands on the toes of her slippers. Now she's going to cleanse him out of her mind once and for all. Good for nothing, Barry, she yells, <laughs> leaning on the stoop, reaching once more for the blue-striped garden hose, aroused at last to action by the poignancy of her failing memory, the yapping on the other side of the windowsill, her poodle, Mitzi, both of them an absolute terror. Thank you.